what I noticed, it was uh, that our oral airway wasn't long enough to reach that distal pharyngeal tissue. And the nasal airway wasn't really long enough in the nose either. But my, my hands were getting tired of holding that patient's chin up. Our patients were complaining of a sore jaw afterwards, even more so than even their incision. And it's like, okay, we need something. Welcome to the Plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones, and I'm so excited that you're here. The Plan B CRNA podcast is the only show made specifically for nurse anesthetists who are exploring options outside of their traditional career paths. This is the place to expand your mind and your goals as we uncover new ways to produce side income together. Join me for some honest, unscripted discussions with other CRNAs who are transforming their financial lives. This episode is brought to you by On Call Capital. On Call Capital is dedicated to educating CRNAs and other healthcare providers about investing outside of the traditional stock market. On Call Capital also provides opportunities for you, yes, you, to create passive income and generational wealth while also lowering your taxable income through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure you do that right now so that you don't miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining me today. And now on with the show. Welcome to another Provider Spotlight episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. My guest today is a real innovator, creating an airway device that is revolutionizing emergency medicine. Roxanne McMurray is a CRNA, a retired clinical assistant professor and assistant program director in the nurse anesthesia program at the University of Minnesota. And she's also an entrepreneur. Through Roxanne's 30 years of anesthesia, medications, anesthesia approach, and patient airways have changed. Noticing the challenges that CRNAs face and keeping today's patients breathing with airway equipment developed 100 years ago, Roxanne invented the McMurray Enha Enhanced Airway. I'm going to get these words right, I swear, Roxanne. <laughs> and she also co-founded the McMurray Medical Group. The MEA is sold in over 40 states and recently received the 2021 World EMS Innovation of the Year Award. The MEA is proving to make a difference in keeping airways open and patients breathing to avoid hypoxia. Welcome to the show today, Roxanne. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you for having me. So, you know, obviously things have changed in the 30 years that you've been in practice. So, when did you actually begin to think about creating a new type of airway? It started about um, 20, 25 years ago. And when I was starting to see changes in patients' airways uh, before intubation, after intubation, and during deep sedation, and doing a significant chin lift or jaw thrust on my patients in deep sedation, and saying, what, what, what's happening? I didn't do this for the first five, eight years of my career. And now why am I doing this more often? And really drilling down to see what is the common theme here? And what I came up with at that time is that, okay, patients who had large necks, so sleep apnea patients, diagnosed or undiagnosed, because 80% of our patients are undiagnosed with sleep apnea, um, obesity, and it was, their obesity rate has increased to around 43% now of our general population is obese. And then the aging population and 35% of us are 50 or older now in our population. But, you know, 20 years ago, it's like, okay, it's not happening to all our patients, but it's happening to a lot of our patients. And what I noticed, it was uh, that our oral airway wasn't long enough to reach that distal pharyngeal tissue. And the nasal airway wasn't really long enough in the nose either, but my, my hands were getting tired of holding that patient's chin up. Our patients were complaining of a sore jaw afterwards, even more so than even their incision. And it's like, okay, we need something. We need something to keep our patients breathing, to make our jobs easier so we're not tethered to their chins or jaws um, holding it. And... I didn't see anyone else doing it. So it's like, okay, I guess it's me. So um, I thought, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's go down that path. I had uh, people supporting me, my family. Um, and so I took on the, the, the entrepreneur role about 20 years ago when I started. Okay, so this has been a real journey 
um, yes, for you yeah. bringing this product to market. So um, obviously you had a concept in your head of what this would look like. Uh, yes. How does that compare to the version you have now um, that you've actually put out to market? Uh, has there yes. been a lot of change in that process? Yeah. So I knew that um, the nasal airway in the mouth was a long enough, not in the nose, but in the mouth that it worked. However, um, with using uh, that device like that, there's issues, um, not only for us as in liability, but for our patients really compromising their airway even more. Um, so it's like, okay, let's, uh, let's use something that's long. Um, let's take all those issues out. Let's put a flange on it so the patient can't swallow it or inhale it. Let's make a elongated bite block so uh, they can't bite through it and sever it, but adding cushion to it so it can decrease dental damage. Mm -hmm. And let's make it elongated too so we have multiple sizes within one. And it started initially with just a, a little wrap around the um, upper airway and uh, making so you can't collapse it. Uh, but with the flange, I took the flange size with the oral airway. And then uh, EMS reached out to me and said, if you put a connector on that, that'll be so helpful, especially if we can't reach the, the patient or the victim's airway to get an LMA in or to intubate, at, at least we could get the MEA in and provide intraoral ventilation. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones who kind of spearhead that initiative. So it's a combination of the oral airway, nasal airway, endotracheal tube connector, the three in one. And how many prototypes did it take? Uh, probably about 20 renditions before we got wow. to the one. Wow. Yeah. That's, I mean, and I remember in practice, I mean, I would take a nasal airway and put the ET tube connector on the end of it yeah. to, to do, yeah. you know, that deeper sedation, um, you know, where you don't want to put it in an airway, um, you know, and, and don't want to have to breathe for a patient. But uh, yeah, so it sounds like you've taken a lot of different concepts and put it together. So was your target the, these deep sedation cases like that? Yeah, initially, uh, that was our, our go to for um, our population group. However, it has evolved like anything, like when you start with a DMP project or if you start with your thesis and what you start with isn't really what you end up with. But um, with the MEA, what we're seeing, um, um, what I'm hearing feedback from colleagues around the country is that intraoral ventilation is a magical, um, it's, it's magical how the MEA can help with difficult uh, ventilation, especially with patients that have a beard which is very popular mm -hmm. now, any facial hair for guys, and um, how it can um, just uh, save on desaturation. And let me tell you a, a couple of stories that I've heard back from CRNAs around the country. And sure. uh, so uh, a patient was in ICU for two weeks intubated because of COVID and they needed to put a trach in. So they brought the patient down to the OR, it was gonna be a controlled situation. And as the anesthesia team was putting a guide wire down, the endotracheal tube inadvertently became dislodged. The saturations plummeted. Uh, the ENT surgeon was ready to put a trach in, but wanted it uh, to be a more controlled situation. Uh, they went to mass ventilate, could not mass ventilate the patient, went to intubate too much swelling, could not intubate, put an LMA in, uh, LMA didn't work. And then the CRNA happened to have the MEA in her pocket because it's mm. a small package where you can um, carry it in your pocket. And she pulled it out. She goes, let's use this before we make that cut for emergency trach. Um, put it in, did some oral ventilation. So put the patient's chin in the palm of her hand, right by her little finger on her left palm, and then pinched the nares closed with her index finger and thumb, and then sealed the lips around the MEA. And she said the sats came up and bounced right back. And then they wow. could do a controlled uh, uh, trach. Wow. Wow. So what yeah. is it that makes this device different then from some of the others on the market? What is what is uh, the, the big change that you've made? Yeah. So it's, it's the distal pharyngeal tissue that is stented open with the MEA. So it sits right by the epiglottis when sized appropriately. Mm -hmm. 
And it's that tissue that sags uh, when we get older. That's what's causing more sleep apnea. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, like the rest of the tissue in our body, it sags. It's, uh, it sags in our, our pharynx as well. And with obesity, there's extra fat deposits in that mm-hmm. pharyngeal area. And so the, the MEA is able to stent that distal pharynx open. Uh, more so than our oral airway that only goes to the back of the tongue. Mm -hmm. Um, It prevents epitaxis because I tell you, if you have one bad nosebleed, you don't want to put in another nasal airway, Mm -hmm. especially with a lot of the older population being on aspirin now. So that'll eliminate that um, undesirable consequences as well. But um, it's, it's the distal pharyngeal tissue that's causing the culprit. And uh, for our, obstructive airway disease. And there's other devices on the market that are external to open that tissue, uh, like the CPAP or the high flow nasal oxygen. Uh, But the MEA is the only distal pharyngeal airway on the market. Yeah. So cool. So cool. I I love it. I love it. So, um, you know, obviously you have a background as a clinician, you have a background as an educator, um, and you, you have Likely, you've got a Rolodex that's pretty thick by this point, I'm sure. So what was it like for those people who were used to seeing you as a clinician and used to seeing you as an educator to all of a sudden, you know, you're approaching them as as more of a, a an entrepreneur, a businesswoman um, with a product that you want to put forward into uh, practice? What what has that been like in, uh, in approaching them in that different way? Yeah. So we all want people to embrace. Um, um, you know, what we come up with. And it's, it's, it's kind of like when you bring a, a baby, a newborn um, into the world and you want people to embrace them and to love it. And I felt like my, the MEA was like my little newborn and I wanted people to embrace it, but that wasn't reality. And people are going to adopt things at different rates. You're going to have people that embrace it, but you're going to have people that won't understand um, why, why is it needed? And why can't I still use things off label? And what's the big deal with doing chin lift jaw thrusts? But, you know, I invented the MEA to make our jobs easier and to improve patient outcomes. That was my whole desire is to, we can do better. We need to improve patient outcomes. Our patients want to have a deep sedation uh, because they don't want to know what's going on mentally. Uh, Physically, they'll be comfortable with a local or regional anesthetic, uh, but Mentally, let's keep them breathing. Let's keep them comfortable. We can do this if we have the right tools. And uh, more people are starting to adopt it. They're starting to understand. And it's 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 kind of like back in the cell phone age uh, when they were first introduced. Uh, and it's like, well, I have a wall phone. That that telephone works on my wall, and I'm going to keep it. I don't need a cell phone. But then after a while, and people say, oh, what is that? And why are you using that cell phone? I was like, well, it can take pictures and it's my flashlight and I can call and I can look up anything. And, you know, now it's like with the MEA, it's like, well, it's, I can use the OPA or I can use the MPA, but you know what? The MEA does a lot more. It's multifunction. It can yeah. open the airway, it can provide intraoral ventilation. But now with the, the new algorithm out for difficult intubation, and it suggests to provide apnea oxygenation, the MEA can accommodate that. Hook it up to your circuit, put it to the left side of the the mouth, and uh, while it's hooked up to the circuit providing apnea oxygenation, you can intubate around it. Yeah, that's really cool too. So so there's several different uses for this device then, which is, I think, uh, the hallmark of a great device. Um, You know, and, and... so obviously, though, it's new. Uh, people are going to have resistance to it. I, I mean, I held on to my flip phone for years before, <laughs> you know, biting the bullet and getting a smartphone, you know. Okay. And then I, I had a bunch of different smartphones before I ever got an iPhone, you know, <laughs> because I, I was resistant to it. So I understand that mentality of not wanting to to always have to change what you do. But with anesthesia changing so much and with the job role of anesthetist always expanding it seems like you've got to do more and be more at the the head of the bed now than you did 15 20 years ago even um i agree 
So you, you want to have your hands free to be able to, to do other things, or you want to have your mind free to be able to focus on the things that you're supposed to be focusing on. So, um, but obviously there's still going to be resistance. So, you know, what kind of resistance have you met along the way and how have you been able to overcome that? Well, uh, I think just, you know, with the resistance, understanding that people adapt at different rates and different speeds and say, and telling them it's, you know, this is an airway when you're ready, uh, reach out to me, but sharing stories of how other people have used it. And, uh, it's more the grassroots is really what promotes the airway mm -hmm. and hearing not from me, but hearing it from other people. It's like, this is how we use it and we love it. Mm -hmm. And so that has been really helpful. Yeah. Well, and as far as going into, um, you know, different, uh, settings and, and different, um, places, are you targeting places, um, that, that focus on deep sedation? Are you targeting the EMS place, you know, uh, trucks, or is this kind of a multifaceted, like, I'm just trying to get the word out about this and trying to, you know, throw it up against the wall and see what sticks. Yes. Yeah, so initially we targeted anesthesia, outpatient procedures and Nora procedures, anything mm -hmm. with, um, deep sedation. Uh, but then into the operating room for an adjunct that could be used for, uh, pre-oxygenation, uh, before and after intubation. And then in the recovery room, because the nurses don't have uh, advanced airway skills, so they can't necessarily put an LMA in or intubate, but they can use the MEA. So the MEA is very useful in the PACU or ICU or on the floors in the cold cart because RNs can place this. They can do interoral ventilation, which is a lot easier than mass ventilation. And as the anesthesia team is arriving uh, at the up on the floors or in recovery, the patient is already uh, under control and has the saturation back to normal. Yeah. So very helpful for that. Very cool. Very cool. So I have to bring up this award that you won uh, <laughs> or, or that your product won and you won. Um, so it's, it's the EMS Innovation of the Year Award for 2021. That's incredible. I don't even know what it's, what it would be like to to put a, uh, a product forward like that and, and have it even be up for that. So were you competing against other people? How did you even, uh, how were you brought up for that award? So our distributor for EMS is QuadMed located out of Florida. And they're the ones who nominated the MEA for that award. And they, they saw that this can make a difference um, in EMS, especially for police and a fire personnel firefighters uh, that don't have the, again, the advanced airway uh, skills, but they can put the MEA in and um, open the airway and also do intraoral ventilation. And they found that to be extremely helpful because they don't have to wait for the paramedics or uh, the other EMS team that have advanced airway skills uh, to arrive before they start getting that saturation back to normal. Yeah. So has that um, opened some doors for for the MEA now um, where it's it's, you know, hey, you've got this you've got a trophy case now to, to support <laughs> yeah. this product. So, I mean, does that open doors for you? What does that look oh, like? Oh, yeah, most definitely. So EMS and targeting that and using our distributors to uh, reach out to people who are interested. And then also with the, the teaching part of it and uh, for putting more videos together and um, talking um, with the personnel around the country. And I tell you, it's, it's a lot of networking, but that is the rewarding part of the of being an entrepreneur is connecting with all these people and networking. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I imagine you have your stuff for like ha setting up a booth at a little conference and, and things like that too. Um, yes. You know, so that's that's got to be a, kind of a fun experience to see people coming in. I always enjoyed that as a practitioner going to conferences and, and just seeing the new products out there. Cause it, it kind of gets your mind thinking too, as a, a practitioner, like, Oh, well maybe I need to change something up and how I'm doing things. Oh, yeah. So, Planting a seed. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> well, what kind of advice do you have for people who maybe they've got some kind of an idea that they want to see come to fruition? And um, how would you suggest that they start trying to create those kinds of products? 
Yeah. So the advice that I would like to give uh, people who are interested in being an entrepreneur or innovator is first to do a, a thorough patent search about your idea. Is there anything out there that is similar to your idea? The second thing is to um, really understand that, um, you know, is, is this a novel device? Uh, is it usable? Is it non-obvious? Those are the three elements that uh, are needed in order to uh, receive an issued patent. Um, also knowing that just because you file a patent, there's only a, a little over 40% that actually get issued patents. Uh, but uh, do your homework ahead of time because it can be expensive if you don't. Uh, and also understand that is your idea something that can save time, um, improve outcomes, uh, decrease costs? Is it is it easy and fast to use? Uh, is it better than what is out there? Um, and can you make it? And can you sell it? Those are the questions that you need to ask yourself before you start down uh, the innovation pathway. Yeah. Well, and I think it's important too. like, just because you've got something that's good doesn't mean that, that you'll be able to sell it. Um, you know, it's, it takes a lot of work to sell things, um, you know, and, and to, to have those stories, like you described to, to have those, those outcomes that are, that are proving something you might have a great product, but just because you have a great product doesn't mean people are just going to flock to it. So yes, it, and, it is. And yeah. And Bobby, when we started um, having different, when we came up with our prototype that we wanted to develop, it took two years to search the globe to find a manufacturer that could make it. And one of our business partners, there's five of us uh, that are business partners for McMurray Medical, but one of our partners has a manufacturing background and a network uh, globally. And he said, it's, it's interesting when you would take it to a manufacturer and a medical manufacturer is like, mm, we can't make it. Mm, we can't make it. And so finally, we found a, a couple of different manufacturers in the U.S. that we were willing to work with, but one in particular because they were a global influence, but they could manufacture the device in a clean room because it's not a sterile product. So I wanted a clean room mm -hmm. and I wanted uh, the people who were making it to have gloves on, to have a suit on, to have a hairnet on and to wipe down everything before uh, they start a manufacturing because it's gonna go in our mouth, uh, mm -hmm. but also to have a package right in the same room that it's made and not to be shipped to another country like Mexico to be packaged. But uh, we found a manufacturer that was willing to take on a no name company uh, with a, a no name device and to really work with us. And I tell you the, the quality and the control that we have within the company that it's manufactured is amazing. So we're very pleased. And especially with COVID with supply chains uh, being uh, slowed down a lot, we are manufactured here in the US. And so our supply chain is pretty solid. That's fantastic. That's really fantastic. And yeah. you're not a no name product anymore. <laughs> you know, and, and that's, that's, what's cool about these things is when you see the hard work that you've put in start to really uh, bear fruit. So, mm -hmm. um, well, this has been a, a great conversation, Roxanne. I really appreciate you being here and I want to give people a chance to get a hold of you. Um, so how can they do that? Yes. The best way to get a hold of us is through our website and mcmurraymed.com. McMurray is M-C-M-U-R-R-A-Y. And then med, med.com, mcmurraymed.com. Okay, great. Thanks for being here. It's been a pleasure. Oh, my, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's <laughs> great to meet you. And thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. What I took away from the conversation with Roxanne was her willingness to embrace change. Great leaders typically have an idea in their head of how things should go, but they are willing to adapt as conditions on the ground change. And Roxanne is no exception, as she's readily accepted that what she started with isn't what she's going to end with in her business. And that doesn't matter as long as she can meet the higher goal of helping others. I never thought that I would host a podcast, but here I am closing in on a year of doing this show. The pandemic forced me to drastically change how I thought about my business, and I've had to adapt to meet that greater goal of spreading the word about alternative investing and helping the most people out that I can. What is it that's holding you back? Are there some small tweaks that you could make that would help your business or personal life really take off? 
what's more important to you? Sticking to some rigid ideal of how things are supposed to go or adjusting your methods to more readily meet your goals? Those are decisions all of us have to make at some point or another. But in the meantime, that's going to do it for the show today. I'll see you next time. So until then, be safe and take care of each other out there. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. If you haven't already subscribed and reviewed the show, I'd be honored if you took the extra time. It really helps to expand our reach and get the word out about the show. If you're a CRNA who is interested in sharing your story on our podcast, I'd love to have you. Please email me at bobby at oncallinvestments.com for more information. This episode was brought to you by On Call Capital. They are dedicated to helping providers like you develop passive income and generational wealth through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. Feel free to check out their website at www.oncallinvestments.com and subscribe to their free educational email series. You can find On Call Capital on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our YouTube page where you'll find all of the show episodes along with other educational videos. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.